Hello. Hello, everybody. Um, I appreciate all of you who've come here when the alternative is you could be queuing up for an early lunch. Um, I thought about doing the same, and then I remembered I had to be here. So I am doing this talk, Selfish Accessibility. I would like you to know that the slides are already online. Uh, the, the URL is rosel.li slash WCEU. So um, this is potentially useful for people all the way in the back who aren't going to see all of the, the, the text or the images in my slides. So you can follow along, um, which means you could conceivably leave, go to lunch now, watch the live stream, and follow my slides. I would do the same thing, except I'm giving the talk. So that's just a bit awkward. Uh, good news is, I, um, after a ton of editing, I managed to get my slides down from 108 slides to 121. That's the wrong reaction, but that's also really, really nice to hear. So um, I'm going to be flying through a bunch of slides in the middle. There's technical stuff and not technical stuff. If you were in Rian's talk earlier, then I'll just throw away, about, I think, about 60 slides because she covered it. So thank you, Rian, you, you jerk. OK, um, look, introductions. So I have a slide dedicated to my ego. just. Just uh, so you know that I'm not just somebody who makes crap up. I do, but other people seem to think there's value in it. I've written some books and some articles. I have a website at adrianroselli.com. You can also avoid me on the Twitters at Ardrian, A-A-R-D-R-I-A-N. Um, just hit the mute, block, unfollow. Uh, the Pastiello Group is a consulting firm around accessibility, remediation, and compliance. They're the ones who allowed me to be here today. Yay! They're going to be surprised when I submit some expenses. <clears throat> you guys are laughing at that, but it's not funny. Also, this, this microphone tastes like croissants. Um, OK, so. Some of you might have seen this A11Y or A11Y or Alley, and I want to give you a little bit of context for this because it's common in the industry. It is a numeronym, and what we do is we take the A and the Y, and then we take all the letters in between, and there are 11 of them, and we replace it with the number 11. So A11Y means accessibility. Um, there are analogs already, uh, L10N for localization, I18N for internationalization. This is handy, though, uh, if you go out to the Twitters and you do hashtag A11Y, you're going to find a lot of people talking about accessibility uh, for good and or for bad. So um, for, for a little bit of context about accessibility, uh, I maintain that accessibility in general gets no respect no matter where you go. This is a photo of when we were first remodeling my office at the company I used to have, which I don't know. It's hilarious. Um, so some of the paint colors, the green post is Lime Ricky. The ceiling, is that gray, is called Cyberspace. The, uh, the blue pillar is called Online Blue. I don't know why. So they have Sherwin-Williams went to all this effort to come up with these really compelling names. And uh, oh, yeah, we did move out of that office. Uh, they came up with these really compelling names, and then they came up with Accessible Beige. <laughs> For those of you in the way back who, who can't see this, you're not missing anything. It's the same color as uh, 1980s era PCs, old IBM machines. So my partners at the time thought it'd be hilarious to paint my office Accessible Beige. <laughs> this might explain why I no longer have that company. So um, these are the things we're going to cover. I'm going to run through some statistics. I'm going to go over my thesis of how to be selfish, talk about some experience models, technical stuff, WordPress, and we'll wrap it all up. So first off, statistics. Um, again, I'm going to go through these relatively quickly, but I want you to at least be aware of them. In the US, if we talk about anybody who has a disability, in that age range of 21 to 64, we're looking at 10% of the population. In that 65 to 74-year-old age bracket, that number jumps to a quarter of that population and continues to climb. And this includes visual, hearing, mobility, cognitive, et cetera, any type of disability. Uh, worldwide, 285 million people have a vision impairment. And as these numbers show, that number uh, tends to climb with age. Hearing impairments, 360 million people worldwide have disabling hearing loss. And that's disabling. There's a far greater number of people who just can't hear what I'm telling them at a party, or they're lying to me. 
probably the latter. So uh, again, that number tends to increase with age. Mobility impairments, 5.5% um, in the US in that 21 to 64 age bracket. The number, that percentage increases with age as well. Uh, cognitive impairments are a lot trickier to try to identify. I've, I've listed some examples. Uh, dyslexia, dyscalculia, which is the, the numbers equivalent, essentially, of dyslexia. Memory issues, ADD, ADHD, for, um, uh, et cetera, lots of different things. We're talking about 4.3% uh, of the population, and that's just the ones that are necessarily diagnosed. There's a, a lot of people out there who struggle with different kinds of impairments, and it's not diagnosed, and some of them are uh, not as easy to define either. I probably shouldn't have put the clicker down. It's priorities right now. So <clears throat> here's the thing. I have been to lots and lots of accessibility talks over the years where people talk about numbers, and they try to motivate you to think about how many people you're going to benefit. And in my experience, that is useless. It doesn't work. People aren't necessarily motivated by that. So my thesis is about how to be selfish. Um, WebAIM is an organization called Web Accessibility in Mind, and they put together this great hierarchy for motivating accessibility change within an organization on a project, etc. And it starts off by guilting people, which is kind of a mean way to do it, and you punish them when they don't do it right. You make it a requirement, so they have to do it in order to, I don't know, get paid. Um, then you start to turn the corner, you reward them for, for making things accessible, you, you hopefully will enlighten them. And ultimately, you want to inspire them. You want people to feel motivated to, to take on accessibility themselves and just make it happen. It doesn't always work. So I put a star on top of this tree, and I call it Make It About Me. Very simple thesis. These other things don't work, so maybe I can make it about me. So here's some ways we can look at that. Um, one of them, when we think about getting older, I showed you some stats earlier as numbers of impairments tend to increase as a percentage of the population. Getting older is something that affects nearly everybody. With some exceptions, you might be fortunate if it doesn't affect you. It's probably a pretty dark thing to say. Nobody's laughing, so clearly I have a darker sense of humor than everybody in this room. Um, it does carry risks and side effects. Uh, definitely not for the young, as evidenced by the very few number of young people I see that are old. Now, see, that wasn't even funny. So. Um, Looking at these two couples sitting here, think about it for a moment. What, what's different between these two couples? What separates them? Be, besides about you know, five, six feet on the, on the curb, the only thing that's separating them is 30 to 40 years. Otherwise, they're probably doing the same thing. They're probably trying to figure out where they're going to go to get some food. All the restaurants are closed. They don't open until 7. We have to drink three bottles of wine and just kill some time. Really the same goals here. There's not a lot of difference. It's just age. That's it. Um, these two women separated again by a, you know, a foot, two feet, and 30 to 40 years, trying to do the same thing. They're both hanging out in the sun. They're both reading. Um, one of them is smart enough to use a solar-powered device that doesn't require battery backup. I'm just going to cross off the rest of my jokes. <laughs> I'll blame it on the translation, because I'm speaking English very quickly. I understand. Um, so another thing to consider, accidents, sort of a situational disability where you might be temporarily disabled. And that comes around from things like broken limbs, um, eye injuries, hearing injuries, head trauma. I am sort of the, the, um, the perfect case of all of these. All of these scenarios have happened to me. I've broken bones, jacked up my eye, been deaf for a while from uh, running concerts, and I have a row of scars on my head. So I've collected everything here. I don't recommend doing that. Um, if you've had a broken wrist, a fractured wrist, a repetitive stress injury, then you might be familiar with um, having your hand disabled for a while and in a cast very difficult to use a mouse or a keyboard when one of your hands is out of commission or the entire arm. Um, maybe you poked yourself in the eye, just keep clicking close window, close window, and now you've lost some depth perception. Makes it a little bit you know, trickier to make sure you're typing correctly, grabbing the mouse, opening the door, uh, pulling something out of a cabinet. Uh, arguably, some people do it as a fashion choice. 
I can't explain that. Um, there's also this notion of uh, cognitive impairments that you know are coming, or maybe you already have. So there's a British guy in the front row who's laughing at this. Um, that's a wheel of cheese. These guys are running down a hill at top speed chasing a wheel of cheese. Argu you could argue that none of them is impaired when this race starts, but they put ambulances at the bottom of this hill because every year when they do this cheese wheel chase, people get injured. They always load a bunch of people into ambulances. This is very much a scenario where they don't start off disabled, but they absolutely finish this run disabled. Permanent or not is a, is a different conversation. Um, you might think that, like me, you are invincible and allergic to nothing, but there are situational modifiers that come into play. Um, you might pretend that you can multitask. You might work in the sun, eat at your desk, not have headphones handy, or the content's not in your native language, like mine would be English, usually. So this is, this is sort of an analog to how I do my work. Um, I sit at the computer with one hand working and the other hand holding a taco. Or since I'm here for another few days, a croissant with butter dripping all over my laptop, which means I'm limited. I'm down to one hand, essentially. Um, and, and I've always maintained that everybody is a keyboard user when they're eating lunch with their mouse hand. It's really that simple. We're all keyboard users every day around lunch. Um, I like to work on my patio. This is not my patio. Uh, in the sun. And when I'm working in the sun, I have to turn the brightness up all the way on my computer. And think about just when you're outside and you're using your phone and you're trying to tweet or text or look up the schedule or whatever, it's very bright. You have to turn your screen brightness up. The contrast becomes an issue. It's a real thing to consider. Uh, these guys are professionals. These guys are multitasking pros. They are so on the ball, they brought a tarp. I mean, how awesome is that? Um, but, but look at them, they are, they are multitasking. Uh, one of them has one hand on his phone and the other on the cigarette. The other one's not even using his hand for his phone, he's just that awesome. But, but arguably, they're distracted. They're probably not super focused on the task that they're doing, and there are things that we can do to benefit those users. I know that I fall into that scenario. Uh, this guy, however, is my favorite. I would like to point out that's a typewriter. <laughs> I mean, really, he's got the whole sun thing sorted and contrast, another solar-powered device. Um, some people I see regularly working in cafes. This is a guy who's probably doing some video editing, might even be teaching himself based on the number of manuals sitting next to that camera. And this is a case where the headphones are really important because he can't necessarily hear the audio if the cafe is full of people behind him, or they just pull one espresso, then you can't hear anything anymore. Um, some of us have to consider what we're doing when we have a uh, partner in bed with us. You know, playing audio and video, not so compelling when you're afraid of waking up the person next to you, or in this case, maybe you don't watch videos of squirrels while the dog is laying next to you. That's a big dog, big, big dog. Um, this is sort of analogous to my living situation. I live in a tiny, tiny house, but I live between people with motorcycles, and they like to have these motorcycle duels on the weekends. One of them wheels his motorcycle out and revs it, and the other one wheels his out and revs it, and is rev, rev, rev. Um, and as a result, I can't have a conversation or listen to anything because all I hear is a motorcycle. This is why my uh, television has closed captions on permanently because I never know when they're going to start. And I swear they wait until that really important scene in Mighty Morphin Power Rangers where they reveal the bad guy. Oh, some fans. Um, years ago, uh, I had uh, my passport stolen in Spain, and I sat down at a keyboard with letters that were familiar yet different to me, and all of my touch typing skills fell apart. And I'm using an operating system that's in Spanish, and uh, surfing websites that load by default in Spanish and I think I can speak some Spanish. You really can't when you're in a panic situation trying to use a full system in a foreign language on a keyboard you don't know. So the language barrier becomes a problem too, and some of the affordances that we think about for accessibility can benefit those situations. 
Um, I'm from America where we have Thanksgiving every year. Uh, we murder a turkey and eat it. And the last thing that I want to do is spend that, that um, visit eating this poor murdered turkey, sitting with my parents, changing uh, printer toner and putting paper in and cleaning all the viruses off their system and all the custom cursors and icons. So realistically, you don't want to be tech support for your family if you don't need to be. You don't want to lose all that potential time you could spend hanging out with your family by sitting, you know, crowding around the computer and trying to um, uninstall, uninstall, uninstall. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some user experience models. Um, normally I do a show of hands, but thank God I can't see past the front row. Hi, Rian. Hi. Hi. Um, otherwise I'd be panicking, uh, which is awesome. So uh, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about user stories in the context of um, these um, um, things that I've put on the screen. The word will come to me later. I'll shout it in the middle of the night. So here, here's an example of, of an example. Here's an example for some of what I've been talking about. As a user on a sunlit patio, I want to be able to read the content and see the controls. This is a tangible user story. Uh, as a user in bed with a sleeping spouse, I want to watch a training video in silence so I can get caught up at work. In order to click links as a user with no elbow room in coach class with a tiny trackpad, I want click areas to be large enough and adequately spaced. Um, I know I'm not the only one who flew here on GOAT class, uh, so I didn't even bother pulling out the laptop because it's just impossible to use. As a user distracted by the television, I want clear headings and labels so that I don't lose my place. Pretty straightforward. Um, these all feed into some personas. These user stories help inform these personas. You might have a different model and a different approach. I'm not trying to tell you a right or wrong way to do it, just give you some ideas. What's great is that Sarah Horton and Whitney Quessenberry have written a book um, called A Web for Everyone, and they have these personas for people with disabilities that are available free online. And if you look at the slides, there's a link there and you can follow it. And they've done some of this hard work for you. They've identified some of the disability types and they've created these personas to support them. In my experience, though, Personas like these tend to get kicked out pretty early in the process. So you're trying to get that number down to three to five personas in many cases, so your blind persona, gone. Your, your handicap, your uh, person in a wheelchair, gone. So instead what I try to do is I take the personas that correspond to stakeholders and I fold in some of those user stories, some of those things that they will have some experience with. I'm appealing to their inherent selfishness. So I have a stakeholder who I know is always traveling, what are some of the things they experience? Coach class, always having a hand tied up, carrying equipment, or holding champagne if it's first class. Um, maybe the sun coming through the window, et cetera. And I fold those into that person's persona. Uh, a business manager, a purchasing agent, whatever. I look at the things that that person does in his or her job, and I fold those into the persona. And now what you're doing is you're creating personas that stakeholders identify with that have temporary disabilities or situational disabilities built into them. And now they're not getting discarded. Now you're not having a conversation about, well, we have a colorblind user or a low vision user, so we need to make the contrast higher. No, no. Hey, Bob, VP of guy who spends the money on this project, um, I know that you're working in the golf course a lot, and it must suck in the sun, so let's kick the contrast up so you can actually see the screen. So I'm appealing to the inherent selfishness of my clients in many cases. I'm going to pivot a bit here and fly through some technical bits because I feel like I'm behind schedule. Am I behind schedule? Whatever. You can, you, nobody's going to lunch, right? Okay. I don't need to see the room to know that that's not going to go over well. Um, just going to run through a series of tips. Use alternative text on images, please. Um, in a case where the images disappear, the alternative text is displayed. Uh, you'll note that there's no text for the kid happily chasing a soccer ball, which is a photo we took right before he face planted into the grass, by the way. <laughs> it was so funny. Um, but the logo in that upper corner does have the name of the organization, Buffalo Soccer Club, an inner city youth soccer program my company helped found a few years ago for 
uh, now has year-round programs, and I know nothing about soccer, so it was hilarious. I also fell on my face. Um, but all of the other images that were in there were decorations, and they can go away, and that's no big deal, but that logo is really important, so it has important alternative text. Um, I'm going to blow through some of these slides because you can read them at your leisure. Oh, look, there's a flowchart on how to choose alternative text. You can look at that when you want. It's just a handy reference. Hyperlinks. Um, it's not uncommon to have sites where you cannot identify what on the page is a hyperlink until you hover over it with your mouse. Just be smart about that. Avoid those click here links. Avoid all caps and emoticons and emojis. Warn users before opening new windows and downloading giant files. Um, good pagination links. Try to make the links obvious. Make the link text consistent. If you're using an image as a link, make sure the alt text also makes sense. Um, please use link underlines wherever possible. Um, in this image, the color for link text is the same as their highlight color. So if it's orange, I have it in multiple um, color blindness simulators. But if the color is orange, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a link. So whenever possible, consider, you know, you're not Google. You're not some special snowflake where everybody understands what your site is about. Just use underlines. It's the quickest and easiest way to make sure the links are understandable. And I have some references to WCAG guidelines as well. Use focus styles. Um, you probably can't tell just by looking at this screen, but this is an animation of me tabbing through the Virgin America homepage. I can't tell where the cursor is at any point as I'm tabbing through the page. Oh, wait, look, the page scrolled. I still don't know where I am. Um, it's an infuriating site that's won a lot of awards for great design, but is incredibly useless to anybody who has any kind of impairment. So uh, this is really easy to fix. Everywhere you have a hover style, add the focus selector onto it as well. If you have any libraries that use focus outline none, kill it, remove it. As, as Rian had said earlier, just use the tab key. First thing you do when you go to a site, start tabbing. If you can't tell where you are, you've got a problem. Um, I talked about color contrast. No, I didn't. I did. Somebody? Whatever. Um, these are screenshots of that soccer club, showing it in three different uh, views. This is if you have tritinopia, protinopia, or deuteranopia. Those are three forms of color blindness. It's important to make sure that there's sufficient contrast between content and links and navigation items and menus, et cetera. And there are some really great tools online to help walk you through that. And there are some uh, widgets you can add to your browser for color, uh, color blindness simulators, which you can also add into uh, Adobe Photoshop. Um, use the label element properly. If I click the label text next to the field, the focus should go to the field. It's just a matter of matching the for attribute of the label with the ID attribute of the field. Really easy to test. Use HTML5. Look, it's a layout. It's one we're probably familiar with. You can probably, without thinking too hard, guess what the HTML5 elements would be. And oh, you were right. Use those elements. They already have nicely built in support for screen readers. If your site is responsive for all contexts where we're just talking about a narrower screen, same thing, just HTML5 still applies, still very valuable for a ton of users. Um, try to use only one main element per page. You could use more than one main element, but don't, because the exception for that is too long for me to get in here into with a little time I have left, and I know you all want lunch. I think you want lunch. Um, use headings wisely. <clears throat> so I have an article with a view of uh, an outline view just based on the heading structure. And even if you can't read the text, you can see it indents a little bit. And that's because my heading structure corresponds to the structure of the content. H1 for the main title, and then a subsection is an H2, and a sub to that section is an H3. And I step back out of it to an H2. Just use good heading structure. If you've ever heard about the document outline algorithm, it's a fiction. It doesn't exist. No browser has ever supported it. So don't think that you can just do H1s all over the place. That can be problematic for some users. Um, use, no, know whether you need to use a button, an input, uh, input type submit, or an anchor. Um, you can style them all to look the same, but that doesn't necessarily mean they are the same. Don't use a div or a span. 
Um, if the control takes you to another URL, if you can right click and open a new window using the ahref. If it changes something on the current page, hide something, toggle something, use a button. If it's going to submit form fields, I recommend input type submit only because button type submit, I find button usually has some overlap with other styles. Don't use tab index greater than zero. Otherwise, you run into this problem where as soon as I start tabbing on the page, it jumps me down to the captcha because they have tab index one, two, three, and four on the captcha. Whether or not you use captcha is a whole different discussion. Also, don't use captcha. <laughs> okay, that's a good response. Um, don't use tab index one or greater. That's the gist of this. It is okay in some cases to use a tab index of zero. This is an example of a grid I had to build for a client where they wanted things to only show on hover or, um, or make people scroll to see the content. If you have scrolling content areas on your page, a keyboard user can't get in there to make it scroll. A tab index of zero on that content area now puts focus on it, and a keyboard user can use the arrow keys to scroll up and down and get to content that was otherwise hidden. Um, please set the lang attribute on HTML. Make it appropriate for the language of the content on the page. I have this whole demo here where I show off how, um, uh, it auto uh, how Firefox automatically chooses between commas and decimals based on your language settings, but it's like 20 minutes to explain. It's not at, at all interesting. Um, but do know that it has wonderful benefits for screen readers. Um, you can, you can force screen readers to say things in the wrong accent, which is hilarious if you want to make like a, a dance techno German version of Nick Cage songs, but that's just me. It's also a separate talk. Um, if you saw Morton's talk this morning about grid, where he talked about flex, et cetera, something I want you to keep in mind, source order matters. As people tab through the page, they tab through it in the order of the code in the DOM. That doesn't mean don't screw around with it, but we've learned some lessons from floats and absolute positioning. Flexbox has that order property which can throw things off, so please don't use that. And grid has the same risk, so just be careful, understand what it will do, tab through the page, see the impact. Uh, definitely don't disable Zoom. You'll never see Bill Murray telling you that you're awesome, because <clears throat> you're awesome. That's my Bill Murray moment. Yeah, whatever. Um, if you go into a page, just remove the user scalable no and the maximum scale of one, and look, it's fixed. Mobile browsers tend to override it now anyway. It's still good practice to get rid of it. Please avoid infinite scroll. Uh, if you have a footer or you have content in the right column, maybe after that scroll area, and you want people to be able to get to it hitting the tab key, they'll never get there. So. I can never get to that grid on the right side when I'm on this page. It's infuriating. Um, it destroys the back button as well. You can't share those URLs to a specific place. Uh, please use captions and subtitles whenever possible. If you're doing video or audio, transcripts are ace. Captions and subtitles are ace as well. If you've ever used YouTube's automatic captioning feature, it creates some terrible things. Uh, this one says, while so long to his Viagra, this is in Sweden when a guy was introducing me for a talk. I, I don't know how he knew. Um, but the nice thing is there's this site, nomorecraptions.com, where you can take the auto-generated captions from YouTube and hack them up, fix them, make the text good, and it'll output it into all these different file formats. It's really handy. If you find yourself doing talks, for example, grab the YouTube video, auto-caption it, clean it, re-upload it. Everybody uses them, by the way. Oh, look, I have a whole other slide that has some links to resources to help you walk you through some of these things. Um, really quick, I'm just going to touch a little bit on ARIA here. Rian had mentioned it earlier. Um, for the most part, you don't need to worry about ARIA unless you're building unique custom elements that aren't already defined in HTML. So don't get too, too excited about ARIA because um, it can be very, very risky. There are five rules to keep in mind if you're going to play with ARIA. If you can use a native HTML5 element that already does what you want, then do it. Use a button instead of a div with an on-click, for example. Um, don't change native semantics. If you've got a heading and you want that to be a button, don't. It's going to throw everybody off. Um, all of your interactive controls that you build with ARIA must be usable with the keyboard. They, they have to be able to perform those same 
those same actions. Uh, definitely don't use a role presentation or ARIA hidden true if it's a focusable element, because that means that some users can never actually get, to, get focus onto that element. And all interactive elements must have an accessible name. So a button has to have a name, a link has to have a name, a tab has to have a name. And usually it's visible text. Um, and if possible, you want to convey the, the current state and what it's doing at the time. And again, Rian had shown a little bit of that with the ARIA expanded example in, in her talk. Um, and if you're in the future watching this on YouTube, you can just go to Rian's talk on YouTube and catch up on that as well. And if you're in the future, I'm sorry. Um, definitely one thing, yeah, I, I have this one example I want to show you on how not to do things. This div on click event is a problem because it won't work for a keyboard user, so I add a tab index so now a keyboard user can get to it. The problem is now I need to trap the keyboard action as well, so I have to listen for an on key, on key press event. And at the same time, I then have to make it not scroll the page because I hit the space bar because I think it's maybe a button. Oh, and then I have to throw a roll of button on it so it announces itself as a button in a screen reader when all along, all I had to do was this. I mean, it really is that simple. You don't need to over-engineer this stuff. Most of these things are already built for you. Um, wow, I'm going to go over a little bit. <laughs> eh, whatever. So um, I had a whole thing I was going to say about this, but mostly you can go watch the video um, and see the transcript. But Rian said something back in March of 2016 that I think is really important. All new or updated code released into WordPress core and bundled themes must conform with the WCAG 2.0 guidelines at level AA. This is important because those are the standards. The WCAG 2.0 AA is the standard that is being recognized by governments in lawsuits by third parties who are getting on board with accessibility. This is, if you want stuff to be in core, you need to follow this anyway. So get on board with it and accept this. I think it's a, a great statement. And I think it's awesome that WordPress is doing that. Um, there's some notes related to that. Um, there's the accessibility ready tag, which you can get for your theme, including some information on how to make that happen. Note that plugins is the response, all plugins, the accessibility on plugins is the responsibility of the plugin author. So as far as I know, there's still no guarantees on that. Um, I would also like to note that Rian Rietfeld, uh, a year and a half ago, was it, won the Heroes of Accessibility Award in the Individual Achievement category. She doesn't like it when I say this, but I think we all need to acknowledge. Yeah. Rian's contribution, because of the status of WordPress, has an outsized impact on the web as a whole, and I think it's awesome, and I'm glad that she did that. And as a result, I'm glad I know you, as opposed to me saying, who? Who did that? There are currently 134 accessible ready themes that you can just download and work with. You can just go. So grab them, ready to go. There are some plugins that um, are out there now that are, have been out there for a while, rather, that help make things accessible. I think Access Monitor uses Tenon to do um, checking. Nice thing is, I, I was signaled I have five minutes, and I'm at the wrap-up portion of this thing. Here's the general message I want everybody to, to, to understand coming out of this, this whole selfish aspect of it. Supporting accessibility now is, is really working to help future you. That's what we're talking about. You're, you're all probably capable of using your equipment today, but 10 years, 20 years, that might not be the case. You might be dependent on somebody else. So getting it in now is going to help future you. It also helps the injured version of you or the encumbered version of you, which could be today or next week or tomorrow morning, depending how much you drink at the party tonight. Um, also, get younger developers to, to help you. Get them to buy into it now. Force them, train them, get them interested. Because once you've moved out of what you're doing today into a different role, you need other people to support this and to support future you. So you have to teach them well. You have to prepare them for this. They have to be able to, to do it well. Um, I have a couple examples where I wrap up here. Uh, this one is the, what I call the stair ramp. 
Um, this is often showed, shown as an example of how things can be accessible and beautiful. And what a lot of people who use this in their talks don't understand is that this is a death trap. Th this is basically a wheelchair murder device. The, 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 the slope on the ramp, way too steep, way too steep. It, each one of them ends in a concrete wall, with the exception of this one, which I believe, I've been told, ends in a pit of crocodiles. <laughs> if you are like me and you take stairs two at a time, it's hilarious. It's step, step, stumble, step, step, stumble. This is a death trap. It really is. What's important to note, though, is this was built based on a checklist. Somebody said, we need to get a ramp into those stairs. And they followed that checklist. There's a ramp. And that's not what accessibility is. It's not just a checklist. There's so much more that needs to happen. There's an aspect of maintenance that's involved here. So a friend of mine in, uh, who, who uses a wheelchair was going to his pharmacy, and when he got to the ramp to wheel himself into the pharmacy, he noticed that they'd put a potted tree on the ramp. So they shoveled all the other parts, but they put a potted tree on the ramp. He could no longer get into the pharmacy. I mean, good for them, they built a ramp, checklist, but they didn't think about how to maintain it. And sometimes maintenance is really nothing more than just not breaking the crap you've already built. Really can be that simple. It's an ongoing process, and when you build it right the first time, you don't need to stress about it going forward. I have a ton of links in here at the end, a uh, pile of resources that you can read at your leisure. Uh, again, maybe over drinks, I don't know. And if I recall correctly, that's my entire talk. I'm done. It's 121 slides. We have time for half a question. Um, you're going to be around. Yeah, I'm going to be around. You're going to have a lunch. I'm going to have lunch. You're going to be that expert bar. You coming to the party? Uh, you, what? You coming to the party? Yeah, uh, tonight? Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. All right. Should we do questions at the party and have lunch now? We could do, you know. Sound good? Uh, or if there are quick questions from the floor. One last call for questions from the floor. Raise hands or go to a microphone. Lunchtime it is. Lunch. Thank you very much, Adrian. Bye. Thank you.